Welcome back to the ECG Stampeders. This is conference number six. I'm Ben. And I'm John. And this is number six. <laughs> number six. Because we've done Spanish and we've done English. We've done Spanglish. Mm, bringing it back to Long Island there. <laughs> okay. Let's now go. it's Long Island. <laughs> okay, so this is our first case for conference number six. Case number 20, a 67-year-old male that presented with syncope. What do you see, John? Yeah, this looks like a fun one to start off our day with. Uh, so the rate, when we look at it, uh, the ventricular rate looks slow. If we count out our QRS complexes, uh, we find the rate to be about 40. Uh, looking at the ECG and the rhythm strip, uh, I do see P waves. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't look like they line up really well, though, with the QRS complexes. And if we walk them out, the P waves look to be regular. Um, and the QRS complexes yeah. look regular as well. But it doesn't seem like they're talking to each other. It looks like there's complete dissociation. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm concerned that this is a third degree heart block or complete heart block. Uh, the axis looks normal. Our intervals look relatively normal. This is a narrow complex QRS. Um, and when we get to the signs of ischemia, I think this is where we have some more findings as well. Uh, if we're looking specifically at the inferior leads, I see some ST elevations in the inferior leads. Um, and I'd also call those T waves hyperacute in terms of just size proportionally to the QRS complex. If we look up to AVL, it looks like we have some ST depressions there. Um, and you could even convince me that there's some ST depressions in lead V2 as well. Um, so for me, this is a complete heart block with an inferior ST elevation MI. Totally agree. The morphology of those ST segments and the inferior leads is pretty worrisome. The, there's not a ton of ST elevation, but there is what we call straightening. So that ST segment kind of comes right off of the R wave. Like if you look here in two, two comes right off of the R wave and kind of check marks up. So let's look in three and do it again. So right off the R wave and just check marks up into the T wave. So that, that we call that straightening of the ST segment. And then the reciprocal depressions really give this away. Yeah, so um, the pre-hospital providers, uh, when they picked this person up with a complaint of syncope and they saw the bradycardia associated with it, they gave the patient some atropine. Do you think that was a reasonable shot there? Atropine? You're never supposed to give that to complete heart block, right? Actually, I think in the pre-hospital setting, that's totally reasonable for this type of heart block because what you see is a narrow, complex escape rhythm. So we look at all these complexes and they are narrow. So what that tells me is that we know that the level of the block is in the AV node itself. It's not an infranodal conduction problem. The level of the block is in the AV node. So atropine may actually help conduction through the AV node and is probably worthwhile to give it a shot. Yeah, I thought it was reasonable as well. Um, so the cath lab was activated on this patient. Uh, but I think this is a great ECG that demonstrates some of the potential complications from what we call inferior MIs. Here we have a great example of complete heart block. Uh, what are some of the other complications we usually get worried about for this? An RV infarct. And if you see someone with a, a RV infarct, they are preload dependent. So whatever preload exists is what they get for preload. Their RV doesn't work all that well, so you gotta be very careful about, about giving them anything that will reduce their preload, i.e. nitro. Cool, yeah, nice case. So this person went to cath lab, had a, uh, had a nice RCA occlusion that was stented, and they did well. Very good, next case. So this is a 62-year-old gentleman who came in with shortness of breath for a couple of days. So what I see is a wide complex tachycardia, and we're definitely gonna beat this to death if we haven't yeah. already. Uh, we've already had a few wide complex tachycardia cases, uh, but I can't stress enough, wide complex tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia, unless otherwise proven, but if you just remember wide complex tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia, you're really never gonna get in trouble. So what I see here is a wide complex tachycardia that's primarily, that's down going in V1 and up going in V6. So it's got a left bundle morphology. If I had an old ECG that had the exact same morphology and a sinus rhythm. I'd be tempted to say that maybe this were SBT with aberrancy, uh, but I didn't have any prior ECGs. Um, and I would just say, in, let me just say, in, in all comers with wide complex tachycardia, in all comers, 80% per of them are ventricular tachycardia. And then the older you get, the more likely it is to be ventricular tachycardia. So if you've got a 62-year-old male that's presenting with this ECG, just assume it's VTAC. Don't assume that it's something less sinister like SVT with aberrancy. 
What was ultimately done in this case, John? Yeah, so the docs who were taking care of this patient decided to try to give them adenosine. Uh, so they gave an initial dose of six and then a second dose of 12 without any changes. So again, that suggests strongly against SVT if they're not responding to adenosine. Yeah, so at that point they decided to uh, use our favorite toy and give some electricity to the patient. Give them the juice. Got the juice and uh, they converted out. Perfect. And ultimately, EP saw this and decided that it was ventricular tachycardia. Yes. Okay, another wide complex tachycardia, oh, John. Gosh. This was a patient of mine. Oh. I had at the county hospital. It was a 73 year old lady that came in with a couple days worth of palpitations. She was stable. But what do you think about this one? Yeah, so again, wide complex tachycardia. Based on what you just said, 80% of all comers with wide complex tachycardia, mm -hmm. VTAC. Uh, as they get older, more likely to be VTAC. This person's even older than the last patient, mm -hmm. 73. So VTAC, VTAC, VTAC coming through in my mind. But when we actually look at this, we can work through our algorithm that Dr. Reynolds has mentioned in the past of how we identify VTAC. Um, and we're looking for some concordance here. I don't see concordance. So what that means is the absence of an RS complex across the precordial leads. There is an RS complex almost everywhere. RS, RS. RS. So that is not the case. So no concordance. Uh, so we'll look at the RS segment um, and see if it's really greater than 100. Um, and I, I really don't see that yeah, here. No, it looks, it looks like it's less than 100 I think it's milliseconds. Less than 100. Um, we're going to look for AV dissociation. I don't really see any AV dissociation. I'm looking for capture or fusion beats or anything that'll give me that hint that this is truly VTAC. I don't see any of that here. And then finally, we're going to look at the morphology. Um, and just like that last case, we have the downgoing QRS complex in V1 and upgoing in V6 that look consistent with the left bundle branch block morphology. Um, and if we had an old ECG that showed a left bundle, I would feel a little bit better yeah, about I agree. <laughs> this. Um, but, you know, overall, tough to say, when in doubt, treat like VTAC. I know this was your case. What do you guys actually do? Well, I actually was, I was pretty convinced that this was SVT with the Berency, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, so again, you would not be wrong just to give them the juice. That would be fine. But if you take a look at these complexes, like in V1, if I just showed you that complex and I showed you this complex in V6, it would look exactly like a left bundle. That's exactly what a left bundle looks like. So primarily downgoing in V1, you may have a small R, but a big S, it's wide. And in V6, uh, it's either kind of a, a, a monomorphic upgoing QRS complex. It may have a notch or an RSR prime. This one does have a notch and there's a left axis deviation. So all of these things are like very consistent with the left bundle. The morphology looks so much like a left bundle. I said, why not give her a shot to convert with adenosine? That's what we did. And she did convert. Nice. And then, then this is the ECG that we got after she converted. Ah, beautiful. Yeah, so it's a left bundle. She had a known, well, she didn't have a known left bundle, but she had an underlying left bundle that is the exact same morphology as when she was tachycardic. So this was SVT with aberrancy. Uh, there was a little comp complicating feature in this case, and that's that after we got this ECG, she went right back into SVT. So we decided to do something a little bit different the next time because adenosine is so short acting. I thought, let's give her something a little bit longer acting. We ended up giving her diltiazem. We dripped it in nice and slow, two and a half milligrams a minute until she converted and then we stopped it. So I think she ended up getting like seven milligrams of dilt or something. She converted it and then uh, we stopped it and she stayed out of SVT at that time. Nice. Yeah, really nice case. Cool. Next. Okay, so this was a 47 year old male. Uh, that presented with chest pain. This is a, another pre-hospital ECG. John, tell me what you think about this. Yeah, love these pre-hospital ECGs we get from our HFD colleagues. So uh, when we take a look at this one, our rate looks normal here. Rhythm looks to be sinus. Uh, we have a normal axis, normal intervals. Uh, and again, our money here is when we're looking for ischemia. Uh, looking for ST segment changes in the inferior leads, it looks to be like there's about a one millimeter plus uh, ST segment elevation in 2, 3, and AVF. When we go back and look at AVL, we see uh, that T wave inversion and a little bit of ST depressions there as well. Yeah. Um, if I look at T wave morphologies, I'd be, you know, I'd call some hyper QT waves V3, and then again the inferior leads, when we look at the leads, particularly 2, 3, and AVF, 
the, the size of the T wave proportionally to the QRS segment look quite large. Um, so based on this ECG uh, with chest pain, I'd be concerned for an inferior STEMI and uh, I would activate the cath lab. Nice, yeah. And you know, one of the things that you may be tempted to call here is early repoll because there are some features of this. He may actually have underlying early repoll, but he's got some J-wave notching. Let's go over here in V5. Yeah, you see that yeah. little J-wave notch? And he's got the happy face, the concave up morphology <laughs> um, of pretty much all of his ST segments. There's even a little J-wave notch there in two. Yeah. Um, I think the money, though, yeah. that's going to take you away from early repoll here and more towards actual ischemia is AVL. Definitely. I think AVL is our money here. Oftentimes, the first changes we see in these inferior STEMIs is T wave inversions and then some ST depressions in AVL. Um, before we even see our ST elevations in the inferior leads, that is often the first finding we see. And, uh, and for me to have those slight elevations with that little bit of depression and T-wave inversion, I'm activating this. Totally agree. Oh, this was a really fun case. By fun, I mean terrifying. I think I'm just going to leave now. I'll see you later. Good <laughs> you luck. Just have, quit. Have, have fun. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to wait for the next physician to come on. <laughs> We this... used to joke, you know, that ECGs look like a whole bunch of squiggly lines on a piece of paper. You know, that, that's exactly what this that's looks exactly like. That's exactly what this looks like. It doesn't <laughs> seem to make any sense whatsoever. So when you see an ECG right away that doesn't make any sense, what do you think? Potassium. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. We'll start out with that. It's, it's the syphilis of ECGs. <laughs> yes. This was an 82-year-old female. Had a, a whole host of comorbidities. Did she have syphilis? I'm sure she probably did. That's we didn't. We didn't check an RPR. Okay. But hopefully she did on her repeat visits. Yeah. Uh, she w pre presented for like a day's worth of episodic syncope. The family had called 911. EMS brought her in. And we had a real problem that day with like boarding. And we had a hard time getting, literally getting her into any kind of room, much less a resuscitation room. So she literally stayed in the hallway for what felt like an eternity. It was probably more like 10 or 15 minutes, which was long enough. Um, but she would syncopize right in front of my eyes and I'd see her go into polymorphic VTAC and nice. then I just wait cause she had an ICD and the EMS was like, wait, it, it, this has been happening. And then boom, <laughs> she'd shock herself right out. The ICD would shock her and she'd come right back and it was just terrifying. That just continued serially. She would just die in front of me and then she'd get shocked and come back. And then finally we got her into a recess room. What would you, so obviously, let's not even try to analyze this. There's just a, a crap ton of ectopy. There's just yeah. a whole bunch of ventricular ectopy. What would you do when you, your first line, you have no other information other than um, this patient's presentation. You don't have any laboratory information or anything like that, but you see a whole bunch of ectopy. What would you think about doing? Uh, so as going along with the EM mantra, I'm going to go with the simple answer and say ABC's IVO2 monitor. Okay, well done. <laughs> And then from there, but you got um, to see, and you didn't, you didn't pass. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when there's a ton of ectopy, I think there's a couple of options. Um, one of which would be attempting to, you know, block some of that ectopy. So something like beta blockade wouldn't be completely out of, you know. Yeah, present. frequent PVCs or the first line treatment for that. Uh, per AHA guidelines, actually beta blockers. So not unreasonable to try some beta blockers. That's actually what we did. That's the first oh, thing cool. we did. Yeah. We I wanted to give her something that was short acting, so we tried Esmolol, nice. and we gave her a push 500 mics per kg of Esmolol. It didn't really do anything. We yeah. gave we tried it one more time just for good measure. It didn't really do anything, and that's when Calvin called. You know uh, Calvin from lab? Calvin, Calvin's a lifesaver. He literally was a lifesaver on this case because he called me and said, Dr. Cooper, the potassium is critically low. It's 1.6. I said, thank you, Calvin. We have an answer. <laughs> she had just started metolazone mm. and uh, torsamide. Ah. And, and then she had also been vomiting, so I think between those things – she got very extraordinarily hypokalemic, and we started replacing the potassium, and then also replaced with the potassium. Hypo K, hypo mag. Hypo K is hypo mag. So we gave her magnesium and potassium, and now I'm going to cycle through some ECG so you can see kind of the evolution of what happened. This is after a little bit of replacement. You can start see it better. start to normalize a little bit, a little bit more. Finally, when she was normokalemic, this is what it looked like. 
Nice. So one question, you know, a lot of the times we hear ventricular tachycardia and, you know, residents or junior learners, they hear VTAC and medical management, and they automatically want to jump to antiarrhythmics. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, I feel like amiodarone is always the first antiarrhythmic out of all of their mouths. That's the go-to. Um, do, do you consider that at all? Do you think it's reasonable here? We did. So when we when this ECG was staring at us in the face, um, we considered giving an antiarrhythmic, and uh, amio was definitely a thought. But I was really concerned that with these episodes of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, that this may have been kind of QT propagated. So if there was a really long QT, which was really hard to see on 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 this ECG. But if, if there was a long QT, I didn't want to worsen that. And most antiarrhythmics will worsen that. Um, in retrospect, it's a good thing we didn't give amiodarone because giving a potassium channel blocker to someone that is severely hypokalemic and symptomatic from it, probably not the slickest move. Not ideal. So she ended up getting a whole bunch of potassium and did pretty well. Cool. Yeah, no, that's, that's really exciting. I think that, you know, reminding ourselves that just jumping to antiarrhythmics isn't always the answer and really working through the why behind this uh, allows us to, to better care for our patients and I think that's what you guys did. But electricity is always the answer. It's way more fun to use electricity. <laughs> All right until next time. See you later guys.